Thank you very much, Roger. Thank you, James. It's, um, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you all to uh, this uh, winter forum of the Russo British Chamber of Commerce this afternoon. Uh, 2020 has been an extremely tough year. I think uh, probably most of us are pleased to see it coming to an end. Um, and we look forward to 2021 with optimism and, uh, uh, and, and hope. Anyway, this afternoon's forum is sponsored by Hudson Sandler. Uh, thank you very much to them and to Andrew Hayes, their managing partner. Uh, and thank you all to our members and friends uh, for all your support uh, over the year. We have an exciting programme this afternoon looking at ESG with respect to the retail sector, as well as hearing about uh, the ESG framework uh, that is being developed for the, from the banking sector. I hope you'll find it uh, helpful, informative, uh, interesting. Um, the event would normally finish off with, um, with drinks and networking, um, but of course that's not possible. Um, but we've arranged uh, to uh, conduct you through a virtual tour of the Pushkin Museum, uh, where we will be guided through the current exhibition on advertising as art, British posters of the late 19th and 20th centuries. Um, thank you very much to the Pushkin for uh, allowing us to do this and for enabling that trip for our members. Um, the museum, of course, relies on donations. Um, and um, should you be minded to make a donation after, uh, after the trip to the exhibition, then there's a link um, to, uh, to the do donation website uh, from our website. Um, and it would be great if you could uh, donate to this world-class institution. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, I won't be joining you for, uh, for proper drinks and, uh, uh, and a chat, but I hope that I'll see you early in the new year. It just remains for me now to wish you uh, a very happy Christmas, a safe and a healthy one, uh, and a very prosperous and effective 2021, and healthy one, of course. Wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Roger, for that introduction. And I would like to add my welcome to everyone for RBCC's almost final event of the year. I'd also like to add my thanks again to today's sponsor, Hudson Sandler, and to the Pushkin Museum for affording us the honor of a virtual tour after the panel discussion has finished. As you all know, the theme for today is ESG, an area of ever increasing importance. And before we take a look at ESG in relation to the retail industry, we're going to take a few minutes to discuss the current trends in the financial sector, which plays such an important role in shaping every industry's attitude to ESG. To do so, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Dmitry Aksakov, who's leading VEB's efforts in developing ESG banking in Russia. Prior to joining VEB in 2019, Dmitry worked as an investment banker focused on private equity funds and tech, firstly for UBS in New York, and then latterly for Deutsche Bank in London. Dmitry graduated with a bachelor's degree from the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. He also has a master's degree from Oxford and an MBA from Yale University. Dmitry, a very warm welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. As we all know, ESG is very much the hot topic at the moment, and I've read that VEB is taking the lead in the financial sector in Russia. Would you mind just bringing us up to date on what progress is being made and any plans for the future? Um, thank you, Alf. Well, first of all, I, I would like to say that I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor to be a, a speaker at the Russo-British Chamber of Commerce event, and uh, I'll be more than happy to to discuss the issues of ESG and answer any questions that you may have. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, why VEB decided to take an active role in developing this movement. Uh, well, first of all, ecology is a very important topic for the Russian leadership. And in recent years, the president of Russia and the members of the government have mentioned numerous times that we need to improve the quality of air in our cities that uh, we need to improve the quality of drinking water and ecological, problem are not, ecological problems are now at the forefront of the uh, government's agenda. And uh, the second reason why we decided to pick this up is that this topic has been um, gathering a lot of attention from, from the international audience. 
For example, the European Union has been uh, driving uh, the topic of green finance forward very rapidly. And lately, we have been hearing a lot about the so-called carbon tax, which is essentially um, um, a tariff which would be imposed on goods important into the European Union from uh, countries which produce those goods using technologies uh, which are emitting uh, more um, harmful, um, uh, harmful waste from the production than the standards set at the European Union. Therefore, we expect that those Russian producers which export to foreign markets, including the European Union, including Britain, uh, and including uh, the United States and other markets needs to uh, bring their technologies up to a standard in order to be able to compete in those markets and in order not to face uh, 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 taxes which would make uh, their goods uh, uncompetitive in those markets. Therefore, we as a financial institution decided that we need to develop a framework for, uh, for the Russian business first to understand with what the what the ecological requirements are for their goods and for their methods of production and also we need to provide financial instruments which would would allow those companies that need to modernize to raise funds to uh, to implement those modernizations and uh, which would allow those companies which want to build new factories and production facilities uh, to build uh, them um, up to the highest environmental standards Therefore, we decided to come up with a so-called ESG framework, uh, which tells the companies what uh, green activities are and how they can finance them. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, that's really interesting because there is a perception in the UK and, and I suppose other Western uh, countries uh, that Russia lags, be lags behind other major economies in terms of ESG. Do you think that's a fair assessment? How, how do you see the situation? I think to an extent, this assessment is fair. Um, even, in, uh, even this year, we've seen some, uh, some significant ecological accidents. Uh, for example, the one in the Arctic region on, on, in Russia, uh, which, uh, which you have all heard about. And we realized that many of Russian companies, even the large ones, even the ones uh, which rely on um, international investors and international consumers still um, uh, face, um, still do not have uh, all of their facilities up to internationally accepted standards. And um, uh, uh, we realize that th this is indeed a problem. However, this year, especially this year, we've been hearing a lot of positive news from Russian companies. Just today, I met with the chief financial officer of uh, one of Russia's major um, fertilizer producers. And he said that um, this year, ESG has been on their uh, near the top of their agenda because everyone, their consumers, uh, their investors, and uh, even uh, the Russian government and their Russian counterparties have been asking a lot of questions about their... Uh, ecological track record and their uh, plans regarding improving their technology. Therefore, although I would agree that many of our companies, even large ones, lag behind our um, uh, European and British counterparts in terms of ecological standards, they start to realize that this is very important and many of them are already taking active steps in this direction. Uh, yeah, thank you, um, Dimitri. I, I, I suppose um, what is also true is, is the um, problems facing Russia are far greater than, than perhaps in other parts of the world. And I'm thinking really of all the sort of oil storage facilities which sit upon sort of permafrost, which, which everyone now acknowledges is melting. And I suppose that's just a, a huge issue which will require a, a fair uh, element of uh, government um, support to, to, to help companies uh, make that adjustment. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know if you want to comment on that. That's slightly... Uh, uh, well, uh, <laughs> Russia is definitely the largest kind of country <laughs> on earth in terms of yeah. territory. Yes, and sure. this, means that, this means that the ecological problems that we are facing are enormous. Mm. And our success in this area also affects the rest of the world.
Absolutely. Yeah. OK. Um, how, how do national standards of business conduct compare with those of other major countries? Uh, well, uh, to be um, to be to, to be honest, um, uh, uh, I, I would I would break down ESG into environmental, social and governance issues uh, uh, to, uh, to speak broadly about commercial standards. I would say that the governance at uh, Russian major companies, which are listed on international exchanges and which borrow actively uh, in international capital markets, the, the governance has been has been relatively well. I, I would say for some companies, it has been very well. It's up to highest international standards. They have international, uh, they have independent directors, they have the right uh, management structure, they have the right incentives, et cetera, et cetera, because all the investors keep a very close eye on how they're doing in this area. But uh, environmental and social issues, they have been uh, lagging behind um, uh, uh, in, in, in many respects. But as I said, uh, a, lot of ten a lot of attention has been paid to these areas uh, this year. Uh, uh, in the environmental area, all the large companies that I have spoken with, um, uh, and these are probably top 20 uh, Russian companies in terms of market capitalization, um, uh, they all said that the environmental issues are near the top of their agenda and they are thinking very actively about how to how to deal with it and uh, the social issues uh, essentially treating their workers right uh, treating um, uh, the disadvantaged populations which live in the areas where they have production facilities uh, treating those people right uh, has been also at the at the uh, center of their agenda and and there are two sources of pressure on them the international source and the national source now. Good. Okay. Um, and, and that really leads nicely into my next question, which is, um, I mean, those ESG standards, I, I think it's fair to say, have been around slightly longer in, in the UK and other Western European countries, uh, and of course, the USA as well. And that they're sort of fast crystallizing in, into uh, a recognized system. Right. I think I think the audience would find it very interesting why uh, Russia sees it necessary to develop a, a separate ESG framework. Or what, what's the sort of thinking uh, behind that? Uh, sure. Well, to be to be perfectly honest with you, we have drawn a lot of inspiration from international standards. We decided not to reinvent the wheel, mm -hmm. but to come up with standards which are which are very transparent and understandable to our international partners. Um, and by the way, we have published our um, green financing guidelines on our, on our website, both in Russian and in English, and everyone is welcome to go to veb.ru and go to the sustainable development section and see our standards. And uh, if you look closely at the standards, you would recognize a lot of things which you would see in the International Capital Market Association standards which you would see in the climate bonds initiative standards and which you would also see in the EU taxonomy. So we decided to make it very, very clear and understandable to our international partners. But uh, the, the question is why uh, develop our own standards if they are so similar to the one in existence internationally? Well, uh, we want to link our standards to uh, special support measures from the government for ESG compliant projects. And in order to link support measures such as subsidies, such as uh, tax breaks, such as um, special regulation from the central bank to uh, meeting certain standards, these standards need to be codified. They need to be put into official Russian documents. So our standards are essentially these official documents, uh, this official document, which, which would be ratified by the Russian government. Um, and uh, another reason for doing our own standards is that even in international standards, such as European taxonomy, there are, there are still many gray areas. There are some activities which are either can be considered green or they cannot be considered green. There is still debate about those issues. And our goal is to have a seat at the table with our international colleagues to, be, uh, to also take part in those discussions. Uh, and uh, develop those uh, gray areas together. Right. And, and just out of curiosity, are, are, are VEB, are, are they the lead 
banking institution or, or um, m m many banks doing uh, their own um, initiatives? Uh, well, we are very glad to see that all that many Russian banks, especially largest banks such as uh, Sberbank, VTB, Gazprom Bank, mm -hmm. uh, they have all been uh, very active in exploring this area. And we are also delighted to see that some of smaller regional banks, such as Bank Center Invest from uh, Rostov and Don, is uh, also um, uh, are all, are working uh, very actively on their ESG agenda. Um, uh, they are improving their own standards, they are coming up with green financing products, but um, uh, VEB has been designated by the Russian government on November the 18th, if I'm correct. It, it has been officially designated as the methodologist, as the body which determines which uh, activities can be considered as green. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, as is so often the case it, it's all about perception and um you know you either get that right or you don't but how, how do you communicate this esg to what is often a, a fairly skeptical public audience right a year ago uh, a lot of our um uh events a lot of our uh uh, attempt to discuss these issues uh, unfortunately uh, fell on deaf ears <laughs> but uh, right now I think in the even in the past three months, we have hosted, I would say, about 10 events uh, devoted to this issue, uh, to which we invited uh, different parties, representatives from the business, uh, from stock exchanges, uh, not only Russian, but also international. We've had an event with the um, uh, Luxembourg Stock Exchange. Uh, we've had events for investors, for the uh, scientific community, et cetera, et cetera. So we have been promoting uh, these issues very actively and uh, all of our uh, attempts to promote them have been very well received. And on the international arena, arena we hope to uh, uh, utilize our expert council. Uh, we are assembling an expert council uh, at VEB uh, devoted uh, specifically to these issues. And our idea is that uh, one half of this uh, council would, cons would um, consist of international experts, uh, such as representatives from um, ICMA, uh, uh, the International Capital Markets Association, Climate Bonds Initiative, uh, investment funds, international banks, uh, etc. And we hope to promote our efforts uh, through this channel as well. And are you finding much enthusiasm from the international side for, for, for your efforts? Uh, fortunately for us, yes. We, uh, uh, it, it was our concern at first that we would not be taken seriously mm. by the international community because we were starting late and our partners could say, uh, well, you could just uh, use what we have come up with and mm -hmm. uh, not uh, do any work on your part. But we have seen a lot of enthusiasm from our uh, Western partners and Eastern partners as well, by the way. Of course, yeah. Great. Okay. Um, can I ask you, what are the key challenges um, you sort of foresee in moving financial institutions towards not only ESG compliance, but really more towards long term value creation? Uh, well, um, although uh, the topic of um, um, bringing our institutions to the highest ESG standards sounds right, sounds uh, like a very noble mission. Still, we see that uh, many financial institutions uh, uh, still don't see uh, being um, compliant with the highest ESG standards as part of their bottom line. Uh, bottom line is still uh, viewed as uh, financial, as purely financial by many institutions. Not the largest ones. The largest banks are realizing that this is very important. But for the smaller ones, the financial bottom line is still much more important than meeting ecological, social uh, um, um, uh, goals. And uh, this is the challenge. This is the cultural problem, I would say. But uh, us promoting these um, values as well as others, uh, and, and I believe uh, uh, Russo British Chamber of Commerce can play a role here as well by stressing the importance of these issues for, mm -hmm. uh, for, for Russian counterparts, uh, can, uh, we all together can, uh, can bring us uh, to a new green world. Yes, yeah, thanks, yeah. No, uh, as it happens, uh, we, we had a, um, 
our biggest forum of the year happens uh, in October. It's, it's called the Russia Talk Investment Forum. And one of the four panels was ESG. And in fact, we had uh, one of the companies you were mentioning who had the oil spill, but, and they gave a very interesting talk on that. And obviously, huge embarrassment for them, but, but they were making a huge effort to, to, to put that right. Uh, and I see this very much a theme for 2021 as well, which we will certainly continue because um, obviously it, it, it will continue to be um, the theme of the moment. Great. Um, we've sort of talked about it in, in some of your earlier comments, but um, th there are a huge number of ESG classifications and ratings um, from all the various institutions. And I think a lot of people find it really confusing that um, a company could be classified as highly sustainable by one rating agency, but then substandard by a different one. And, you know, I thought th this has got to be a, an important issue, um, you know, and I know everyone calls it greenwashing uh, because it fundamentally will undermine the public's trust in green finance. Uh, very interested on your views on that and if there's anything practical uh, we can do to sort of overcome it. Sure, sure. Uh, I have been doing some research on why this happens in Europe and uh, other parts of the world. And the reason is that there, is, there has not been a single standard which is viewed as a universal by everyone. There are different standards which are gradually converging to each other. And uh, uh, as our European uh, colleagues has, have been telling us, uh, eventually they, they, they hope that the standards would converge to such an extent that there would not be such discrepancies between different ratings. Um, uh, in Russia, uh, obviously, there are also, uh, uh, because uh, until now, there has not been a single standard that there have also been some contradictions between different ratings. Um, uh, but um, in order to avoid uh, the notion of greenwashing that you have mentioned, we want to start, uh, we want uh, to have, uh, to, to select our pilot projects very carefully. We want to do the projects which would be seen as universally green by everyone, which would be seen as green by the, according to the Chinese taxonomy, according to the European taxonomy, and according to the Russian taxonomy. And we are going to, dis to expand gradually from there, venturing into areas which are less explored at the moment. Great. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Dmitry. I, I think we've got probably time for one more question. And uh, again, you, you alluded to it in, in your uh, your previous comments. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what ESG compliant projects are in the pipeline, and, and maybe uh, talk a little bit about how how those came about and and, and the sort of ESG hurdles uh, companies had to sort of overcome. Right. Uh, at VEB, we have three areas of priority for us. One is the high value added production, essentially uh, factories, uh, large factories. Uh, um, uh, the second area is the urban economy. And the third area is infrastructure. The first area obviously is associated with the largest projects. And uh, the ESG projects that we see in the high va um, uh, value added area is essentially modernizing Russian factories with the latest uh, ESG compliant technologies or building new factories which are up to highest environmental standards. With regards to urban economy, examples of uh, ESG projects are uh, modernizing uh, the urban transportation, for example, replacing uh, uh, diesel powered buses with electricity powered buses or uh, hydrogen buses, um, expanding the, um, uh, the uh, electric transportation and replacing city lights with more energy efficient lights. And uh, with regards to infrastructure, examples of projects are um, uh, using ecologically uh, friendly materials, such as ash from, um, uh, from burning various things uh, for building roads, for example, um, or building uh, energy efficient airports and seaports, uh, et cetera. So these are the priority areas for ESG projects for us as a, as, as a development bank. Great. Okay, um, that I'm afraid is all we have time for. Um, as I said earlier, um, ESG is not going away <laughs> anytime soon, and I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to talk to you next year, hopefully if you, if you will come back on to hear how some of these projects are developing uh, and, and to get a further update on, on um, uh, how, how the... Uh, framework for the banking sector is going. 
Um, thank you very much for your insights. Um, good luck with all your projects, and I hope you'll stay for the rest of the forum. Thank you very much, Alf. Delighted to be here, and uh, thank you again for the invitation. No, pleasure. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Um, I'd now like to hand over to Andrew Hayes. Um, he's a managing partner at Hudson Sandler, um, and that for our next activity, which is a discussion about ESG and the retail sector. Many of you will know Andrew. Uh, for those who don't, he's one of the most experienced financial and corporate PR advisors in Europe, uh, and he's heavily inv involved in the firm's Russian uh, practice. Andrew, if you're there, thank you very much. And we're all very much looking forward to hearing the panel. Спасибо, Alf, thank you very much for that very yes, fine great. introduction. And thank you very much for inviting Hudson Sandler to sponsor today's forum, which is a great honor for us, given all the brilliant work you and your team are doing, Alf, um, in challenging times to build trade and investment flows between our countries. So we're very, very pleased to have the opportunity to support it today. By way of background, Hudson Sun is a leading strategic communications and sustainability consultancy working in Russia, where we've been active for 12 years, supporting many fantastic clients across virtually every sector of the economy, from our offices here in London, as well as our offices in Moscow and Hong Kong. Now, today's panel discussion is focused on how the Russian consumer is putting, or not putting, sustainability at the heart of its relationships with brands as we enter, hopefully, a post-pandemic world over 2021. Conventional wisdom is, as we've just heard, is that Russia, Russian consumers are behind those in the West when it comes to paying up to tackle climate change and social dislocation. But that easy assumption belies many of the realities we're about to discuss. To discuss them, I'm delighted to have five expert panelists um, here today. Firstly, Rebecca Gudgeon, who is a colleague of mine at Hudson Sandler and our partner heading up our HS Sustain franchise, focused on environmental, social and governance for clients who want a differentiated approach to cut through all the noise around ESG. Secondly, Michael O'Brien, who is the Senior Corporate Governance Specialist at BNY Mellon, giving him a unique insight into why 85% of investors are willing to pay a 10% premium to acquire stocks with a positive ESG record over ones with a negative profile, according to McKinsey. Thirdly, Maxime Comtin is chief storyteller at Dodo Brands, a really fascinating international group um, developing a portfolio of digital first QSR brands, perhaps best known for its pizza business which is now the market leader in Russia by some way and operating in 13 countries. Fourthly, David Henderson Stewart, who is, manager, direct, who is managing director at the Rakita Watch Factory, where iconic watches are engineered that were used by Soviet cosmonauts and polar explorers, now, now focused on providing precision watches for the discerning buyer. And finally, but by no means least, Irina Anshushina, who is Director for Sustainable Business and Corporate Affairs for Unilever in Russia, Ukraine and Belarus. So good afternoon, panelists. Delighted to have you here today. Uh, Andrew, sorry, can I just interrupt? We can't see you. Are, are you sat away from the um, uh, video camera? No. Okay. Well, you, you're oh, sort of, um, if you can get closer, that might help. Uh, it, I can't get any closer. I'll be kissing it, Alf. Okay, sorry then. Okay, we can hear you perfectly though. So sorry. I don't know what's wrong there. And let me have another go. Um, is that? Do you see me now? Uh, no, you're sort of floating. You're you're half in, half out of the screen. Which uh, when I when it happens to me, it's because of the distance from the um, video camera. Is that better. Then I I know the room that Andrew's in. Andrew, if okay. you move to, towards the um, video camera and TV screen on the wall, we will be able to see you. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Sorry about this, everybody. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> yes, almost. Is that better? Is that better? A, a bit, but not quite. I tell you what, Al, why don't we carry on? And I, I'm not particularly attractive. Yeah, okay, carry on, yeah, I think that's good. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting, thanks. That's Thanks for that, but I think we'll carry on. I'm sorry you can't see me, but I don't think you're missing much, I promise you. 
Um, now, given as to questions uh, for those joining from the forum, please submit them through the chat icon, and I'll pick out as many as time allows during the conversation. And also, given time constraints and the breadth of the subject we're discussing, um, I've asked panelists to keep their answers relatively brief and sharp, if you can. Panelists, thank you very much. So, first question. Let me start up with a general question about whether the pandemic has accelerated or held up the focus of Russia's consumers, Russia's consumers on healthy choices and sustainability more generally in your various sectors. Can I ask you first, Irina? So hello everyone. I hope I'm not floating. Everybody can see me pretty well. Uh, so yeah, actually, I represent a company which operates in the FMCG market, and uh, you know we're, to be honest, we're one of the few lucky ones who weren't really uh, affected highly by the pandemic because you know we produce soap and soup, as we say, uh, and most of the products are basically of essential. Uh, consumer needs but in general I would say that definitely we have seen some emerging trends especially when the pandemic stroke so uh, obviously we have seen a, a rising interest towards uh, cleansing agents like Domestos for example it was super popular at that point of time even despite the fact that some consumer view it as a high uh, price solution for home care uh, we have seen a significant surge in uh, the in the consumption of soap and uh, both liquid and uh, regular soap was popular uh, regardless of the region so it was one of the you know highest in demand products that Unilever produced at that point of time um, interestingly we have seen an increased consumption of tea um, because you know people moved uh, to their homes from the offices and you know, uh, obviously coffee is usually consumed as something, as a solution uh, for you to, you know, uh, start to kick off the day <clears throat> in the office in the morning. And we saw that uh, tea has become a much more uh, pre preferred solution for most of the consumers who work from home. Um, we have seen a, a slight change in the consumption of uh, um, of hairstyle products, obviously, because, you know, people would mostly use them to go to work, from work, for any other outside, out, out of home occasion. That was not the case anymore. Um, interestingly, we don't see this trend much for the next year. So we have recently been looking into the analytics provided by our partnering agencies, and we see that some of the trends uh, were mostly tempor temporary, basically, and uh, I don't know if it, this is connected mostly with the optimism of our consumers believing that next year we somehow magically will uh, switch back to office modes, but, you know, we'll see. Uh, uh, obviously, this affected some of our uh, uh, some, some some of our decisions in terms of how we appear at points of sales. So we try to uh, not to actually push the products in demand, but to try and inform our consumers in the most appropriate way that they can not only buy just the products of our brand, but products of other brands as well. This is what, for example, our global brand Lifeboy uh, so brand has been doing. So when they communicate it um, to consumers, they actually said that you can use a Lifeboy soap or any other brand of soap uh, that you would like to use, even a competitor one. So yeah, uh, we have seen this, you know, as an FMCG company, we have seen some shifts, but generally uh, what's really encouraging is that we still continue to operate for the needs of the consumers. And what's important that all of our factories stayed operational because we saw that our products were still in need for most of the population. Thank you very much, Irina. Um, interesting. Tea sales have gone up in Russia at home and alcohol sales have gone down. I think we've seen the reverse dynamic here in the UK. Um, um, Maxime, can I ask you next, please, uh, Dodo's experience of how the impact pandemic is impacting trading, particularly around healthy eating agendas, if at all? Oh, yeah, thanks. Um... Well, uh, I have to say that, uh, in, in, in my view, the, uh, the sustainability question is quite tricky in the food service industry in general, uh, all over the world, but uh, it was especially tricky here in Russia during the pandemic. Uh, to begin with, uh, I think that we honestly, we don't see that uh, huge demand for the 
sustainability policies, uh, neither from from our customers nor, nor for from from the government. Uh, I say I, I would say that um, it wasn't uh, top on the priority list uh, for, for for both of these groups, and uh, it was before the pandemic, and uh, the pandemic made it even worse uh, in three ways. Firstly. Uh, it's obvious that the food service industry was hit the hardest in this pandemic or among the hardest uh, hit on industries uh, everywhere in Russia as well. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, we see that uh, uh, the demand is growing in delivery and uh, delivery uh, is, uh, is unfortunately uh, is, is an, uh, a sector which is infamous for its uh, huge waste because uh, you, every, everything that is delivered has to be packed. And uh, while doing deliveries, we, uh, we are doing a lot of, uh, we are producing a lot of waste. And uh, also every delivery is delivered usually by car. And it's another like uh, contribution to the carbon emissions. Uh, and uh, the third factor is probably that uh, we, of course, uh, as a society, as a population, we want to stop the virus and to uh, make it spread as, 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 slow, uh, as slowly as possible. And uh, hygiene plays a great role here. Uh, and, uh, and it increases our impact on the environment as well, because Right now, uh, you know, for example, the government uh, uh, introduced new regulations. Under these regulations, we have to wear gloves uh, in the kitchen where we, when we are cooking. Uh, it's questionable. Uh, it can be debatable uh, whether it's a proper solution in terms of hygiene and uh, the fight against the virus. Uh, because, in, for example, in our experience, and uh, I think that uh, a lot of people from the restaurant industry would agree with me, uh, in our experience, uh, it, uh, it's much uh, safer and easier to control hy hygiene standards uh, when, you use, uh, when you cook with your bare hands and wash them regularly than with gloves. But uh, the regulations are here and we are, of course, we follow them. And, but the, these uh, produce lots of uh, used gloves, uh, totally non-recyclable, uh, obviously. And we, as, a, as, as an industry, are... Uh, producing lots of, uh, un, uh, so our, our footprint is uh, becoming even more unsustainable than it was before the pandemic. So we have, uh, to sum it up, we have, uh, we have uh, operators who are uh, fighting for their survival. And of course, when you are fighting for the survival, you, uh, you aren't thinking about uh, like long-term effects of, of, of your uh, business or of your actions. Uh, we have uh, uh, growing delivery, which is uh, worse than dining uh, in many aspects, and, or who can be worse than dining. I, and I'm not, not talking about uh, uh, our, our, our company, but across the, across the sector. And uh, uh, thirdly, we see government and hygiene standards that producing lots of, lots of uh, uh, waste. And um, uh, so in terms of your question about healthy habits, uh, we don't actually see anything like that. Uh, uh, people are happy to, uh, to have a meal delivered to them because uh, sometimes their uh, options for dining in are limited. And so they are happy to, uh, to eat whatever they, they, they like and maybe even more, uh, uh, they are willing to more like indulge in, in uh, unhealthy eating uh, than, than before the crisis, obviously because of the, of the uh, pressure uh, uh, everyone is feeling. That's who, about can, it. I mean, uh, who, who can resist a delicious dodo pizza? Who can resist it? Oh yeah, yeah, no idea. <laughs> and David, in the, in, in the world of um, um, watches, and watches of course do not have chips or batteries, and perhaps taking a slightly longer term view, do you think the pandemic is going to have any impact on how your brand is regarded and to your advantage in the longer term, or is it is it is it can be exaggerated? Well, um, I personally didn't notice in any way that the pandemic has increased the focus of for Russians towards sustainability, yeah. uh, at least in my sector. Uh, what I did know, I mean, uh, 
the focus towards sustainability basically is, is changing your behaviors in a way that makes it more difficult doing things that you wouldn't do otherwise. I was very surprised how much Russians are disciplined in terms of social distancing and wearing masks and gloves and all of that. So to some extent, I think this is, I was surprised and I think this will, it shows that Russians can change their behavior. Um, that's all I can say in terms of um, um, in our sector, because um, uh, in terms of su su sustainability. Thank you. And Rebecca, wouldn't that reflect what we're seeing here um, in, in the UK as well as Russia? It hasn't really, it's probably pushed it slightly down the agenda. I don't know. Would you agree with that? Um, I think it well, I think it very much depends on the company, certainly with the some of the big industrial companies where we do a lot of work with Russian big industrial companies, we have seen, um, we've seen corporates um, sacrifice things like certain board committees and um, other investment opportunities before they sacrificed the, the their sustainability um, commitments over the last year. And actually, I this year, Magnet launched um, an absolutely amazing sustainability strategy. We know Lent is along the same road as well. And I think there are two reasons why what we've observed in terms of our Russian clients, why that's happened. And that's about sustainability covering much more, sustainability is a catch-all term and it can be anything. It can be environmental, it can be social, it can be governance, it can be the whole piece. Um, and I think the focus is very much, because of the pandemic, has very much been on the social piece of that. And actually just responding to that has kind of driven quite a lot of the sustainability strategies or the, imp the, uh, the delivery of sustainability strategies over the, last, over the last year. And then I think also there are a lot of companies we work with who are very aware that they might be listed on Western stock exchanges or have, um, have investors with, with a Western mindset who and they're all looking. They're all looking to you know the economy post pandemic. So they all want to make sure that they emerge from this period in a good, strong place to be able to um, have the ESG profile that they want for, from day one post pandemic. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. I'm picking that up on that, Michael. Um, in your experience, what kind of valuation premium can Russian corporates realistically expect from international investors if they rate highly on ESG metrics? Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, it's difficult to say, quite honestly. Uh, we haven't really seen a whole lot of rush uh, a lot of research focused on Russia specifically with regards to uh, premium valuations uh, caused by ESG. But there certainly has been a lot of research internationally um, looking more broadly. Uh, as a matter of fact, MSCI had conducted a survey on this or uh, did a research paper that just came out last year with regards to the premium value, valuations that can be expected. Uh, they looked at uh, a basket of stocks from 2007 to 2017, about 1,600 stocks uh, that looked at if they have uh, higher ESG ratings and what kind of impact that has on valuations. What they really found was uh, that, that typically if you see higher, value, higher ESG ratings, you will see higher valuations. There's typically a lag period of about three years, though. So uh, what they're generally seeing is that if, if you have ratings increases, that it's really ratings increase momentum that's causing the higher valuations, not, not the higher valuations themselves. And, you know, I think it's important to really, you know, put that in context to a certain degree. It's not the ESG ratings and the, having the higher ESG ratings that causes the higher valuation. It's the things that went into you getting that higher ESG rating. So, you know, it's not like there's a whole lot of international investors out there that are investing based on ESG ratings. They're, 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 they're looking at the things that have caused it. So, you know, that you need to be, you know, very careful about not assigning uh, causation when there's correlation. So typically we see the ratings, uh, typically see we increase in valuation. Um, you know, I think one of the common things that we see amongst our, our issuer clients, they'll talk about, you know, hey, we've made these uh, initiatives, we've, we've put resources into this. We really haven't seen anything that's come to, to fruition as far as valuation is concerned. You know, I, I think you need to kind of, you know, put it in context of, 
first of all, Rome wasn't built in a day. As I say, the, the, what we see as far as the research is there tends to be a lag why this is you know, uh, recognized by the market. And two, you need to be realistic about what are the initiatives that you've actually uh, put into place. Were they material or that were they more low hanging fruit? So, you know, again, it's the market's gonna is gonna in, uh, invest based on what they see from an operational competitive point of view, from a strategy point of view, and that is the offshoot of enhanced ESG practices. Again, it's not the ESG rating that's gonna drive this. Michael, just a quick quick supplementary on that, please, before we move on. Is the G in ESG under more scrutiny in Russia than other markets you operate in, or is that a, 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 a shibboleth that we shouldn't pay too much attention to? Um, I think there is certainly uh, an amount of scrutiny that is higher within Russia uh, based on uh, the framework of the marketplace. Uh, as, as everyone knows, there's a lot of government ownership, uh, uh, a lot of uh, majority ownership uh, by, by wealthy individuals. Uh, and that is, is not really indicative of best practices from a governor's perspective. Uh, that typically leads to fewer independent directors uh, that, that shows up within the committees, within the board of directors, uh, less scrutiny on, on related party transactions. So I think there's certainly more scrutiny on it. Um, and I, you know, that, that's kind of the, the anecdotal kind of thought on it. I actually kind of tested that premise though, by looking at uh, the database from MSCI and looked at the weighting that Russia has with regards to governance versus all the other countries. And in, in looking at that, we saw that Russia, as far as the weighting, rated on average 64th among 75 of 75 countries that receive weighting. So it's not as though Russia is the only uh, country that has some of these kind of systematic issues with regards to the majority ownership and the impact it has from a, from a governance point of view. Uh, the, the interesting thing was when we looked at, again, the MSCI research, as far as where's the weighting uh, directed from an E, S, and G angle, it's all pretty equal. Uh, uh, governance only slightly led, they were about 34%. The rest is around 32%. But when we compared that to other countries, environmental was the thing where really Russia stood out as far as a lot of emphasis uh, from a weighting perspective. They ranked sixth of 75 companies, even though, again, it was only about 32%, which shows us, again, based on the economy in Russia, which has a lot of extractive industries, um, that's why it's so high. So again, governance certainly scrutinized, but, but again, I think it's more, more important is the industries that you're in, the, as far as the companies, and the materiality of the issues. Uh, so, you know, that's what we're seeing. Thank you very much, Michael. Now, the question I really want to direct to, at um, uh, Maxime and Irina, perhaps Maxime first, how important is community engagement to your brand propositions and what initiatives have you put in place to support in this area? Well, uh, we, uh, I have to say here that we are a franchise. We are in the franchising business. So uh, only a handful of our, one, like uh, a, a few dozens of uh, pizza shops in, in our network are company owned. The rest are uh, launched by our franchisee partners. So every franchisee partner is uh, highly engaged in, uh, in their local communities, obviously. And uh, being active locally is a great uh, part of, of uh, how they do business and how they uh, um, connect with their customers. Um, that's it. And, and the, Irina, I mean, obviously Unilever puts a huge focus on this area globally. How does that play out um, in the Russian context? So yeah, this is actually true in terms of the global agenda because uh, I think, uh, 
early, like two weeks after the pandemic struck, we announced uh, our intention globally to invest 100 million euros to support uh, communities and international organizations in tackling this agenda. And, you know, being a fancy G company, uh, as I already mentioned, makes the task easier. So what we did in Russia, uh, we outlined uh, the communities in need, not only the consumers, but also the hospitals, for example, and schools who required uh, immediate supplies of uh, products like home care and soap. Uh, and uh, what we did, we um, um, outlined an out outreach program which uh, span across five cities where our factories are present. So they, that would be uh, Moscow, where we have the central office, Tula region, St. Petersburg, uh, Ekaterinburg, and Omsk. And uh, in total, we managed to donate about 80 tons of our products, which are worth of uh, roughly 400k euro market value. And uh, that was a, that, that was actually one of the uh, one of the immediate actions that we had to do. You know, uh, not just being present on the shelf, but trying to provide our products uh, to the people in need as much as possible. Thank you, Irina. And Rebecca, I know you do a lot of work with clients across Russia in this area as well. Uh, yes, and I think I think it's interesting. Russia is really interesting. We work with we work with clients across the world, and while we've seen a we've seen a marked increase in the last two to three years of clients from any part of the world looking to build a sustainability strategy. And I completely agree with Michael. You can't have an ESG rating that means anything unless you've got all the work behind it. Your ESG rating is a reflection of your sustainability profile and the commitments you're making and the programs you have in place to, to actually meet those goals. Um, but what I think is unusual about Russia is um, and what we certainly see, particularly in the heavy industrial side, is the kind of mono-industry towns and how that drives a different sort of social license to operate. Um, so we saw it with um, one of our clients, Rusal, who um, have a load of aluminium smelting operations in and around the Akutsk region in Siberia. Um, when the pandemic hit, the first thing they did was build a hospital for, for COVID patients. And it was... And it was a Roussel responsibility to build the hospital. It wasn't a state responsibility. It was something that they just knew they had to do. Then no one asked them to do it. They did it because there is this sort of when everyone in a in a town or a city works within a certain industry or within a certain employer, then there is a much stronger social sort of license to operate that, 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 that sort of is in place there. So, yes, we've definitely seen a real... Um, a real increase in the kind of the tangible outputs of what Russian corporates are doing in terms of community engagement over the last 10 months. Yeah, I mean, so big business in Russia certainly seems to have uh, had more of a role than we would have seen here in the UK and other uh, Western markets. And David, yeah. I can ask you a, a question sort of related to this. How much does sustainability mes messaging play into your overall brand marketing? I mean, are you actively trying to build, build Raketa as a sustainable brand or a luxury brand that just happens to be responsible? Well, uh, sustainability is not the main message that we're trying to get across. Uh, we're, our main message is promoting, um, you know, values like um, the cosmos and other Russian, you know, achievements. Yeah. But sustainability definitely is one of the messages, uh, which is important for us and especially important for our customers. Um, um, our sellers in shops, they use the argument that goes along the way to say that these watches don't have any batteries or electronics. So basically, uh, you'll never have to throw them away. Um, they can run indefinitely as long as you take care of them. Um, unlike many Swiss brands, it, there's a kind of tr tradition in Swiss brands is that the more expensive the watch is, uh, the, the, the bigger the box is. And, um, and a lot of people criticize that. We, we had big boxes at the beginning because um, we tried to copy the Swiss and now we try to do things a bit differently. We have very small boxes and people appreciate this. And these are cardboard boxes, which obviously are recyclable. Um, so it's not the main message, but it is an important message. And our clients in Russia do understand that, especially the first argument that says that uh, these watches are totally ecological because um, they can run forever indefinitely and you will never have to throw them away. 
It's interesting, and David, just a supplementary, but looking at it from another perspective, when you're looking for investors to come into the business, presumably they're looking at how, how ecologically responsible your production facilities are very closely. Yes, so um, so we are so we are raising equity for the, at the moment, and we are talking to um, one particular foreign investor. Uh, it's a professional investor, and we were uh, uh, very surprised how much he paid attention to. Uh, basically, he wanted to know exactly how we uh, um, disposed of our hazardous waste, and we do have hazardous waste, which is um, chemical products, oil, um, uh, mercury lamps. And he not only wanted to know uh, the names of um, the, the companies, uh, he also wanted to see the contracts. He wanted to make sure there was an official contract, there was no cash involved. And uh, he also wanted to, he was surprised that some of these companies didn't have licenses. So in Russia, you can dispose, dispose of um, certain hazardous waste to companies that don't necessarily need a license. And this investor was quite surprised and I do know that he asked his lawyers to double check this information. So they did some re legal research and they confirmed this. So um, we, we were very surprised how, how deep they went into uh, trying to understand um, how much we, uh, we, um, uh, we conformed with all the rules in terms of waste disposal. Very good. And David, can I recommend very strongly that you use Rebecca Gutter to help you uh, in that dialogue in future? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Arena, can I ask you uh, a, um, a question, please? Are you seeing any regional variations in the sustainability agenda, particularly between Moscow, St. Petersburg and the regions? Why I'm told it is often local authorities that take more of an effective lead than federal bodies. Uh, yeah, I would, I would say there are two angles where we can actually approach this. So coming back to your first question and not seeing any differences and how uh, people reacted to the sustainability agenda. I would like to recall uh, a purely you know, sustainability related project that we're running both in Moscow and in some of the regions. Uh, this is the reverse vending machines, which we have installed with our retail partners to collect plastic bottles. And obviously uh, this is something where uh, the actual presence of consumers and their ability to visit those stores is directly affected. Uh, what we have seen is that uh, when in April, for example, there was a huge lockdown across Russia for quite a while, we have seen obviously a significant decrease in how many bottles were submitted to these reverse vending machines. What we have not seen is that since we have those uh, machines installed in five different regions, uh, the dynamics of how actively people try to use these machines was basically the same. We actually have two of them installed in Krasnodar and Magnit, which was mentioned by Rebecca previously. So probably it has to do a bit with the image of Magnit being a sustainable, a rising sustainable retailer. We have not seen any difference in activity between uh, consumers who wanted to uh, get rid of their plastic bottles in Moscow versus consumers who wanted to do this in, in Krasnodar, which actually is quite inspiring for us. And it actually inspired us to uh, extend the regional uh, chain of reverse vending machines next year. So that's going to be a huge piece of use we're going to announce very soon. Uh, what we have seen is that indeed the regional authorities have reacted quite differently. In some cases, they have reacted even more actively than the federal federal authorities, even in terms of how they treated the businesses and how they included them in the in the in the list of systemic so-called systemic enterprises so in some regions we had to wait for a long time for this to happen and it obviously affected the way how we could support our employees in getting the necessary permits for their work in how they could uh, even now get some of the vaccines right now or get tested from COVID. So yeah, and uh, this is, you know, when we when we discuss this with our management, we, we have actually seen some uh, interesting comparison with how it works in the US, for example, how, where the regional agenda is like super strong and uh, each of the states is like very self-servant, I would say. And this is something that in our 
um, in, in our experience, Russia has seen. And uh, in some regions, it was actually easier for us to do community outreach, uh, specifically in St. Petersburg and in Moscow, obviously. We had to tackle some of the bureaucratic issues when dealing with other city regional authorities. I don't know, either to, to either because they weren't really feeling the need for the companies to help them or to some other reasons. But yeah, we have seen slight differences we talk about that very interesting um now a question for you all i think moving away from the pandemic um it's related to the pandemic but um as we all know real real living stands in russia are now under uh, under pressure um do you think that russia consumers going forward and let's take a longer term view on this if the economic situation remains um, challenging are they going to regard for instance high quality food provenance or ecological friendly packaging as more of a luxury that they can forego in the short term for lower prices and that catching up with western standards is being put back or put on hold as people come under more pressure perhaps i can put that to maxime first uh yeah uh, what i can say here is that uh, as I said before, uh, we don't see uh, we don't see customers pushing us to be more sustainable. We don't see uh, the government uh, pushing us to be more sustainable. What we are doing, we decided at some point that we want to lead here, and uh, it, it it coincided that just this year we uh, publicly committed to uh, doubling to double down on sustainability uh, as, a, as as a group. And uh, to, uh, right now, we are uh, actually uh, assessing everything that we are doing in terms of uh, our packaging, our supply chain, uh, in terms of uh, our own uh, practices in the office. Uh, and uh, we have like around 300 uh, people just manage, just working for the managing company. Uh, there were some already some like interesting um, uh, revelations when we. We, we separated uh, uh, our trash, like uh, uh, plastic and, and paper and, and, and the rest, and, and our uh, business office was, was collecting it, but then we uh, started to like, investigate what happens next with this trash, and we realized that most of the trash that goes, for example, in plastic actually isn't... Uh, 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 thrown away is thrown away basically because uh, it, it can be recycled and uh, uh, the, the the current infrastructure can process it. So we are rethinking our own even strategy in terms of like our small office uh, waste, and uh, we are rethinking our uh, our big strategy for like packaging. We are looking for the most innovative uh, cutting edge uh, solutions uh, from all over the world uh, what we can introduce uh, and uh, we are doing it that because we feel that it's it's the right time for us uh, we used to be a very small company that was like uh, fighting for survival every day right now uh, we have some uh, resources and we uh, we have uh, we can do it and if we can do it, we are going to do it. But in terms of like the demand, uh, I, I'd like to like say it again. We don't see that uh, yeah. uh, uh, like pushing for it. Uh, that's I mean, uh, how we see it. Thank you, and that, that's very interesting insight into the Russian dynamic. Irina, Unilever is obviously a huge global business. Do you see very different dynamics between paying up to stop climate change? And higher prices in different countries um, do, are they very different experiences or is that completely the wrong way to look at it in any event um if, if we if we don't talk about pandemic right you know in general so i would say that the climate agenda is quite it's quite new for us uh we have been doing a lot of stuff around plastic like i mentioned previously it's been like super high on everything that unilever does uh climate agenda is gaining more ground externally and this is actually one of our top priorities uh for uh, for the upcoming five years uh, what we have not seen is actually 
uh, first of all, the understanding of consumers of how this should be dealt with. So a huge responsibility here lies with us and our partners to try and educate consumers maybe on how, uh, uh, how where their, their responsibility lies and, uh, and how we tackle this agenda. And second of all, if we talk about the government, so we've been trying to drive this one on some of our um, platforms where we cooperate with the ministries. And, uh, you know, the only uh, probably small step that we have seen is the recent decree of the president, uh, you know, with the famous number 666, which actually pushes for more uh, ambitious goals uh, in terms of carbon emissions. And uh, this is something where I believe we can play a larger role. Uh, we have uh, a huge agenda related to sustainable logistics and we try to approach it specifically this year despite all of this pandemic uh, issues that we're facing and we see that uh, probably Russia is going to be one of the last uh, countries in the Unilever list to tackle this one because we don't really have immediate solutions for that for our business so it's going to be a huge huge challenge for us to happen to make happen. That's very interesting. And Rebecca, I know you're doing a huge amount of work, for instance, in Africa, where, mm -hmm. where incomes are obviously very low compared to Russia and developed markets in the West, um, but a huge focus on this area nevertheless. I, I, think it's, I think it's global. And I think where you have a consumer base that is either doesn't have the social, financial, um, inclusion that perhaps uh, you know, we, we would expect then then there really is a focus so I don't think this I don't think that kind of social piece is and the consumer the part of the consumer plays it is, is unique to Russia at all. Thank you Rebecca and Michael perhaps if I can ask you from an investment perspective um, Russian companies adoption of ESG values what stage are we at now how would you characterize where Russia is in terms of adopting these metrics and embedding them in their um, operations and their investment propositions? Um, I think we've seen uh, significant gains over the last five to 10 years, without a doubt. Um, you know, I've been with BNY Mellon for 10 years in, a, in an ESG capacity. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I work globally also. And uh, particularly from a governance perspective, uh, Russia is by far uh, the clientele that I that I engage with that that is looking to make the most amount of gains there. So I think um, I think you've come a long way, uh, but as as I kind of pointed out before with some of the uh, the rating statistics which I have, you know, I think it's demonstrated that there's still a way to go. Um, again, looking at those 75 companies or countries that that uh, that MSCI has ratings on. And which is not to, to insist that ratings are the end-all be-all for everything. Uh, but of the 75, Russia currently is ranked 64th of those. Uh, so there's, there's still a way to go. We've seen a lot of gains. Um, you know, I think the important thing to realize is that, uh, you know, there's certainly a perception from uh, a country, uh, country characteristics, but, but investors look at uh, companies on an individual basis. And if you're outperforming uh, your peers, both globally and locally, uh, that will be reflected in the valuations and the, and the demand uh, that you have for the stock. Thank you, Michael. Uh, can I remind everybody, please send in your questions through the chat um, device and I will try to put them to the panel. One's come in for you, Maxime. Um, it's from Olga Petrina. Um, will it be possible to use copters for delivery for delivering your food in Russia or in the UK? And is it something you're looking at? Uh, Olga, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I think I know <laughs> where it's coming from because in uh, as far back as 2014, we launched uh, the world's first ever uh, real commercial pizza delivery by drone. Uh, but uh, it was quite a success and made the waves all over the world. But uh, we had to shut the, the situation down because there weren't basically any regulations uh, in place back then. And uh, to be honest, I don't believe that, I don't see it, it's happening in the near future, uh, especially in, uh, in the city landscape, because uh, drones, uh, 
steel they uh, have to be like they uh, they they are very heavy if they have to be to to carry a heavy weight like like for example a pizza or a few a, a few boxes with pizza and it can be pretty dangerous uh for if 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 the drone basically falls and, uh, i think there is some potential in drone delivery uh, in rural, rural areas, like I don't know, in New Zealand, where there are like all these fields, and uh, it's 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 much easier to cross this field and uh, reach some distant area uh, with with the drone than going uh, on the road. And uh, but yeah, since we are talking about sustainability, I don't think that uh, this is the area you would like to uh, to be focused uh, if you want to to like. Uh, uh, make a difference in sustainability. I think the packaging uh, and uh, uh, using the most obvious like ways of transportation, like uh, e-bikes, scooters, it's a, it's a better way to uh, to tackle this. Thank you, Maxime. And David, coming back to packaging and your focus on small packaging that's uh, more sustainable. When you when you export, does that become an issue? And you need to be closer to the Swiss model. Do you find international purchasers? Uh, um, are in line with your thinking on this? No, um, everyone is, 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 um, appreciates to, to receive a, a small package. Um, well, first of all, when you go to a shop, and imagine you're a tourist, you, you buy a big box, it's much more difficult to transport back home, right? So everyone appreciates the small box and everyone is very aware that a, a small box is, um, is much more is much better than a big box in terms of sustainability. Uh, and we communicate on this topic and this is something people like and understand um, and uh, across all over the world, as well as in Russia, as well as, as outside Russia. Thank you. And Michael, again, from your perspective, which companies in, um, in the Russian market do you think um, have succeeded best in communicating their ESG agenda and embedding it in their business models. Who, who, who are the poster boys and girls um, in Russia, as far as you, you, can, you can see? Uh, are you asking from a, a sector point of view or are you asking from a, a company point of view? Well, I think sector would be interesting. You may feel it's too sensitive to pick out companies, but I'll leave it to you. <laughs> well, you know, as I mentioned before, um, you know, and, and this is, is certainly there's no uh, no denying that you know the Russia is very much an extractive industry uh, led pump led, led uh, that, that's what leads the economy there. So there's certainly some difficulties from that point of view, from an ESG and a sustainability point of view. So that that kind of clouds the the country overall. So for, for, from that perspective, we look at those that are outside of that industry certainly those in the service industry or the grocery industry, uh, where, you, where, where again, sustainability measures are, are easier to, to communicate and not tied to the environmental um, taint, so to speak, uh, that we see in those other industries. So that's, that's generally where we see the communication is best. Yeah, and it's interesting, we worked with Magnet on the launch of their sustainability strategy recently, and it really is a world-class program. Benchmarks very, very credibly against big global leaders. And Rebecca, your work you're doing um, in Siberia, you're doing a lot of work in a certain very ecologically sensitive lake. Um, how would you characterize, I mean, in terms of working with the authorities, working with um, the, the leaders of the businesses you're, you're supporting, how would you benchmark that experience against what you've been doing elsewhere in the world, particularly in the fishing industry, for instance? Um, thank you. I think I think Russia and yes, Andrew's right. We do a lot of work around Lake Baikal, um, which is the world's oldest, largest um, lake and contains a fifth of the world's natural fresh water. Um, so and it is a UNESCO heritage site as well and um, has a lot of endemic species. And so we're doing quite a lot of work on programs with our clients on programs around protecting the quality of the lake, um, not least because it actually um, is used to generate hydropower. Um, which goes to generate the electricity that powers the whole of Siberia. So there is a very practical usage for this. So the lake has to be kept in tip top 
condition. I would say that there is, because of the sort of federal nature of the government around Lake Baikal, it has been um, perhaps problems that would have been addressed sooner in other parts of the world are, are now being addressed. Um, but again, we're seeing, the cor- we're seeing the corporates lead on that and it being a push on the federal government to actually put the regulation in place that will stop the heavy metals leaking out of water treatment plants into Lake Baikal rather than as we see in some other countries where we work, um, you know, the government imposing regulation upon the corporate. So it is a kind of reverse there. Um, But the reason I think, I think a lot about Siberia, I spent a lot of time thinking about Siberia and visiting Siberia. I think we've seen a real upturn in the number of um, Russian companies who are now very rapidly coming towards the, the, the process of building a sustainability strategy and doing it in a much more serious way than we see some other companies do it. And I think things like the problem at Norilsk Nickel um, have really kind of opened everyone's eyes up to perhaps what the potential is. And Norilsk Nickel too, that the incident that happened there to a greater or lesser extent was a result of global warming. So, you know, when the permafrost goes, the whole kind of land that things are built on and, and, and resting on actually becomes less stable, then accidents will happen. So. I think Russia and Siberia in particular, over the course of two months last year, they saw catastrophic fires, droughts and floods that killed people. Um, So they really are at the sharp end of climate change. So I think there is quite a lot of um, waking up to the fact that they they need to do it. I've actually got some figures. According to the IPCC, um, Russia's um, climate increase is, is set somewhere between 4 and 12 degrees. Well, on average, they agree about 4.5. It depends who you ask. Now, that is significantly higher than anywhere else in the world. So the IPCC recognises that Russia really is going to, going to suffer. Um, and also, even if you just look at history, since 1960, Russia has heated up. The, the, kind of the, the rate of increase in temperature in Russia has been two and a half times the global average. And in the permafrost region, so Siberia, and east and north of Siberia, um, it's been four, three to four times faster than anywhere else in the world. So global global warming, climate, the climate crisis is having a, a demonstrable impact on Russia and on Russian business. So I think that is driving quite a lot of this. Yeah, that's fascinating, Rebecca. Uh, staggering statistics, very interesting. Now, I'm gonna ask one final question. To the same question to all of the panelists, please, because um, we're coming to the end of the session. And the question is, can you identify one ESG trend that you think we will see more of in Russia in 2021? Now, Irina, I know Unilever must be modelling this in every way imaginable. Um, what, what's the one trend we'll see more of in Russia in, next year that you would pick out? Um... I think if we if we talk about not only next year but probably the next ten years, we have we have seen that the ecological environmental agenda has been like super high, and I've mentioned that uh, climate change is going to be you know the talk of the day in the upcoming years. But in my opinion, I would say that the social uh, aspects. Uh, are gaining ground as well. And I would say that tackling inequality, specifically in Russia, specifically after this particular year, would be a huge challenge for everyone. So tackling financial inequality, uh, maybe something dealing with how people view uh, the society, the stereotypes. So anything dealing with you know inclusivity versus inequality has to be in the spotlight and it will be in the spotlight for sure. Very interesting. And Maxime, from your perspective at Dodo, is there a trend you all think we'll see more of next year in Russia that you that you think is worth um, highlighting? Well, uh, to be honest, I think that all the trends that we are seeing across the globe will will uh, come to Russia sooner or later. Uh, it's hard to predict which one will uh, land faster, uh, like the uh, next year. Uh, but I, uh, what I can say is that. I would definitely hope to uh, to see like more uh, more effort on the on the government side because lots of things uh, at least uh, where our industry is involved uh, depends a lot on the infrastructure, for example, for recyclable uh, uh, garbage and uh, things like this for for things like. Uh, I, I'm based in, in Berlin and uh, in Germany, and uh, it goes without saying that every every building here uh, has like 
uh, lots of different uh, uh, trash bins for, like, for, for plastic, for uh, bio uh, garbage than, uh, uh, and, and others and others. And uh, unless you have the same infrastructure uh, in, in, uh, in Russia, uh, and this infrastructure has to be built by, by the government, uh, you you can do a lot uh, about it uh, because uh, you can you can you can make your like uh, your pizza boxes uh, the most uh, uh, recyclable uh, ever pizza box in, in, on this planet. But if there is no infrastructure to to like to collect yeah. them uh, and uh, to recycle them, uh, it will it will be all in vain. And I see that you know, in Moscow there are like. Uh, first innovations uh, and uh, this infrastructure is being built and uh, I believe that it, it will be coming uh, and I hope it will be coming to other cities uh, in the country. Very interesting and um, David can I put the same question to you but before I do a question is coming specifically for you which would also be interesting to have your answer on. Um, it's uh, what difficulties do you meet when promoting Russian brands in Europe? Perhaps we'll just deal with that and then a trend that you'd like to highlight over the coming years? Uh, well, it, um, it, it, a very short answer to, to, to this question is actually it's much easier to promote a racket of watches outside Russia than in Russia. Yeah. Uh, people uh, very much like the fact that we're a niche brand that stands out from the crowd, which carries very strong values linked to you know, Russian achievements in art, avant-garde art, cosmos, sabrinas. And also that it's our watches are manufactured in house. Uh, people understand that and appreciate that very much. Um, so actually, we think that promoting our Russian watches and brands outside Russia is is, is much easier than doing this the same job in Russia. Interesting. In in terms of um, thank you very much for the question. And and in terms of um, I agree both with Irina and with Maxim, uh, um, with Irina, because I also think the ecological topic is a very hot topic at the moment in Russia. And I certainly think that um, Russians are very much becoming aware of it. And I also agree with Maxim when he says that most of the trends worldwide eventually reach Russia at some point or another. I, I, I've lived in Russia for the past 20 years and I, I've really seen it. Um, eventually everything comes to Russia at some point. And the same question to you, Rebecca. I'm going to put my I mean, I think all the trends we're seeing at the moment will continue and grow, but I'm going to put my money on something slightly different, and that is biodiversity and nature-based solutions. And I think the scale and kind of the natural resources that Russia has at the moment will mean that becomes increasingly important. And when it's kind of linked to the climate thing, when you think that a fifth of the world's um, forest is in um, is in Russia. Um, and the forest is absolutely critical to, uh, as a carbon sink, to, to sequestering um, some of the greenhouse gases we're putting out. It's a, it's a vital part of, of it's a vital part of addressing the climate crisis. So I think we will see an increased focus on protecting biodiversity and nature-based solutions that will drive that. Yeah, very interesting. It's what David said in the previous session that um, Russia gets this right, the whole world really does benefit. Exactly. Country. Yeah. And Michael, let's finish with a good old investment perspective. <laughs> what you, what's, what's going to be the trend in ESG when people look at Russia next year and the year after? Uh, you're certainly throwing me a curveball there at the end. So um, I'll come back to that in a second. As far as the trends I think that are most important for Russia, again, I point to you know how energy and the attractive energy is such an important part of it. We're seeing... Um, we're seeing enhanced uh, and more stringent uh, regulations, particularly in Europe with regards to energy and the use of energy and what's acceptable, particularly from a carbon perspective. So um, I think looking at Russia is the ability to, uh, to raise their game with regards to being to able to fulfill that need, that demands in those requirements from a Russian point of view. So coming back to the investment perspective, I think uh, investors are going to be looking uh, quite, quite closely at the ability for Russian companies to, particularly Russian energy companies, to, to be able to uh, provide the, um, the, the product in the way that uh, the neighboring countries will deem to be acceptable um, to do that going forward. Um, 
You know, I, I, I think that the brush is maybe a little behind the curve with regards to re renewables. Uh, they have such a, an expansive uh, uh, um, um, supply of, of the traditional energy resources. So uh, I think that'll be looked at closely uh, in, the, in the near and longer term. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. That brings us to a close, the panel bit of the um, forum. I know there's a fascinating virtual tour to the Pushkin Museum about to happen. But I want to say thank you to all the panelists for your time. I hope um, all of the panelists, except David, because he would have done it already, is going to buy a loved one a Raketa watch for Christmas. <laughs> the coolest brand you can find. And um, thank you, everybody. Have a very happy Christmas. And let's hope you all have a prosperous and healthy new year. Alf. Andrew, uh, many thank you. Uh, many thanks for a really interesting panel discussion. Um, I'm just sorry we didn't see you. <laughs> Although I suppose to a certain extent it is in the Christmas spirit and uh, you were very much the ghost of Christmas past as you shimmied, very, in, uh, very sh shimmied in and out of uh, a picture. Anyways, um, I'd also like to add my thanks to the panelists. Fantastic um, insight there, Michael, Rebecca, Irina, Maxim and David. Uh, and as I said to um, Dimitri, uh, obviously ESG is the topic of the moment, and, and I'm sure we'll have plenty of uh, time in 2021 to carry on the fascinating discussions. Anyways, without further ado, uh, we'll now move straight into the virtual tour of the Pushkin Museum. Um, and I'd just like to say, please remember, there is a link on the website for donations to the museum. Like all museums, Pushkin relies on voluntary donations. And if anyone feels like making a donation, please do so on the link provided. Um, I'd now like to um, introduce you to our host, Irina Karabanova, who is head of fundraising. Uh, in her previous life, she used to work as a counselor for the Russian Deputy Minister for Culture. She's also spent considerable time with UKTI at the British Embassy in Moscow. Irina, a very warm welcome, and thank you very much for organizing this tour to one of the world's great museums. Over uh, to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, very grateful to RBCC for the opportunity uh, to join this Winter Forum Online 2020 and welcome you today. Uh, we all know that uh, culture is the most important part of our life and um, uh, of the UK-Russia cooperation. The Pushkin Museum of Fine Arts is the largest museum of European art in Moscow. The museum collection currently includes more than 700,000 paintings, sculptures, drawings, applied works, photographs and archaeological objects. Today, RBCC launched a donation campaign in favor of our museum. Many thanks. Please join. You can find the link at the RBCC or the Pushkin Museum websites and make your contribution. It can be either small or big, it's up to you. We will be thankful for any contribution you can make. I also invite you to become a member of the Museum's Club of Friends. It was founded six years ago and it approves every year. Now we have about 2,500 members. We would be happy if your company could be interested in our sponsorship opportunities. Next year, we'll have a number of great exhibitions. Those who are interested, please drop me an email and I'll send you the detailed information. I'll um, write my contact details in the chat. And now I'm delighted to introduce our guide, Ilya Malakhov, who will invite you to the exciting journey to the Pushkin Museum of Fine Arts and the exhibition of British posters. So Ilya, you're welcome. Hello, uh, thank you very much for coming and thank you very much for the opportunity of sharing pleasure talking about the British art this London afternoon and Moscow evening. I'm an art historian and the guide of a fundraiser uh, Department of the State Pushkin Museum here in Moscow, and I'm going to conduct a brief, about half an hour length, virtual tour on the exhibition advertising as art, uh, British posters of the end of 19th and the beginning of 20th century. And first of all, now I'm sharing my screen. 
First of all, it is important to mention that for the last two decades, Pushkin Museum has been collaborating with different British cultural institutions. And recently we had wonderful exhibition of William Turner, William Blake, last year, Thomas Gainsborough and London School of uh, Francis Bacon and Lucian Freud. Uh, they also had pre-Raphael art. And all those events were very successful and popular, but they are hard to understand for Russian and as I believe, non-English museum audience because the British fine art is unique in a very specific way. And this uniqueness was best formulated by a famous art historian, Nicholas Pevsner, in a series of his BBC radio podcasts and in his best-selling books called Englishness of English Art. He emphasized that approximately since 16th century, the UK is forger of the world. It is a, a mistress of the seas, the most politically, economically, and socially developed world um, country. But it, its art cannot be uh, considered as something avant-gardistic, and it, it is not cutting edge, and it is not something that the rest of the world tries to imit imitate. To explain this, Pevsner says that creative impulses of Great Britain are as strong as um, French and Italian, for instance, but they take a regional shape, something that he calls English, Englishness. And I'll use his approach on our uh, tour. And this exhibition was a real discovery for me. It's the first English exhibition which is organized without learning pieces from English museums. It explores on the Pushkin Museum collection. And in my opinion, it is very interesting in artistic, sociological, uh, historical, and even anthropological points of view. It consists of six halls. They're dedicated to historical context, um, advertisements of commodities, underground posters, posters of London public system uh, of transport, uh, shell posters and Art Deco advertisements. And we will briefly go through them using Pevsner's approach. And this will allow us, as I hope, to show how the best example of artistic commercial was built up in England in previous century and how that made some specific features of the British culture universally valued and globally appreciated values. And to begin, I'll start with a brief historical context. Um, a daughter of Russian aristocratic house, Elizaveta Vodovozova, visited London in 1880s. And one day she was walking around the city and she saw how a group of guards accompanied prisoners just through the center of Regent Street. Uh, they were wearing terrible uniform, they looked sick and exhausted, they were enchained, and every one of them had a text wealth prisoners on their backs. She was completely astonished, and a few days later, she found out that that was a promotion of a theatrical performance called Wealth Prisoners. In London, at the dawn of Victorian age, the end of 19th century, was the biggest European city and probably the most industrially developed one. And under these conditions, there was a giant, enormous, tremendous demand for advertisements in the city, and all the city space was of different kind of posters, as you can see on those pictures. And when the quantity of advertisements is so high, uh, they become faceless and monotypic. And the only way to develop uh, their competitive uh, power is to develop their intrinsic quality. And to solve this uh, task, a group of talented artists turned to posters at the end of 19th century. And so, here we are in the first hall of our exhibition. And I would like to briefly describe three approaches that were invented by those artists. And the first one was actually made by a group called Beggarstaff Brothers. And they formulated how a good poster should look like. It should be laconic, use minimum of figures and a short motto. And it must be effective and memorable for a person who sees it through a bus window just riding by. And their visual language is quite uh, similar to the language of French avant-garde, for example, affiches of Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec uh, or other French artists of 
1980s. Uh, the next approach was formulated by late pre-Raphaelite pre 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 artists. And actually, they were the founders of modern design. They formulated aristocratic, bohemian, sophisticated, elitarian painting art and wanted to expand it to furniture, um, wallpapers, paper production, and everyday environment. And here we can see a calendar uh, which was presented to subscribers of the studio magazine, and it is made in pre raphaelite style. And lastly, the third approach, and my favorite one, was uh, invented by Chinese painter Vin Aubrey Vincent Thursley. And we can see his poster here. Thursley was one of key figures of the aestheticism movement, a movement of pure art. He was close to Oscar Wilde, and he was famous for his social behavior, image, and subtle style of writings. And uh, Wilde spent his last days in a cheap hotel room in France, and his last words were, uh, one, of one, one of us must go, it's me, or this ugly yellow polka dot wallpapers. And after that, he passed away, and Dursley was white like Oscar Wilde. He put art in the center of his life. He created drawings with almost supernatural dexterity, uh, very effective uh, visual images with minimum uh, artistic sources. He used expensive Japanese paper, rare coloring and rare pigments, and all his drawings were meant to be reproduced as posters. He was particularly interested in uh, poster making, and he wrote in 1892 an essay about commercial art. And he said that England is besieged by beauty. The achievements of modern avant-gardistic art they will break through um, posters to the city streets. Light uh, commercials will shimmer in the sky, and electronic music's, music will play on the street. And it's the most complex approach to developing intrinsic quality of posters. But uh, all those ideas faced a resistance from an aspect that Pevner called one of Englishness features of the United Kingdom. Here we can see beggar stuff poster compared to the famous and expensive affiche of Toulouse-Lautrec of um, the Aristide Brown show in Cabaret. And here we can see the studio almanac calendar compared to famous affiliate uh, of John Everett Millet, which visited Moscow about six years ago. Um, and so the resistance was uh, based on the fact that the British culture is a culture of strict social hierarchy. If a man is born in a certain class, especially in the 19th century, he has very little chances of going to another class, and he must follow a special uh, etiquette based on traditional and conservative moral values. And in these conditions, art meant to be something about sublimity or beauty, beautiness, and artists cannot um, work on posters, something momental, uh, pragmatic, and connected with money, of course. And because of that, all those approaches were uh, forgotten in 1880s, but they were picked up in 1920s, as we will see in this exhibition. And moreover, uh, the poster itself as a format faced a serious resistance with this social hierarchy and conservative moral values. As psychological studies of 20th century has shown us, um, advertisement is as ancient as graffiti, strong language, uh, jokes, and similar phenomena. And it is based on two basic mechanisms always. And the first of them is sexual sublimation. And here we can see a poster promoting a book called Aisha. And then a potential consumer uh, saw a poster like that. On subconscious level, he believed that if he buys the book Aisha, he will gain access to women like this depicted. And it's probably the only uh, naked image, uh, the only image of naked woman in the whole exhibition. And now let's move to the next hall. It is dedicated to 
advertisement of commodities of the late 19th century. And here we can see example of another advertisement mechanism. It is magical material fetishism, which was highlighted, for example, by Freud. Here we can see a poster which promoting cigarette called Good Lion. And the potential the holder, when he saw this poster on subconscious level, he believed when if he buys the cigarettes or smokes the cigarette, he will gain uh, some features of a person depicted, for example, his bravery, attractiveness, image, and so on. And both those mechanisms uh, did not correlate with uh, conservative British society. And in this, under these uh, conditions, uh, British advertisement and commercials uh, made new mechanisms of poster effectiveness. And here is one of my beloved pieces of our exhibition. It's a poster which uh, promotes uh, dark brown ale. Uh, it is called Bar Barley Wine here because in the 19th century, due to globalization, all types of goods from all over the world were easily accessible in every European country, something like modern supermarkets appeared and French wine was gaining more and more popularity among English middle class. And this name, Bali wine, must uh, increase competition power of English beer against uh, French drink. And if it was a German poster of beer, we would see a beautifully rendered big glass of beer. If it was French one, we would see a half-naked woman erotically posing near a nice cup of beer. If it was an American, we would see a housewife giving a glass of beer to her husband who has just returned from work. But this is the English poster and we don't see the beer at all. And in conditions then, uh, two basic advertisement mechanisms were prohibited or not accepted. Uh, English advertisements place with local impressions and emotions. And actually, in the beginning of the 20th century, about 20,000 uh, civil workers lived in the suburbs and they went to the capital by train. The only thing that could prevent them from going to work was uh, a snowfall. It paralyzed the railway system. And here we can see a civil uh, worker. He can't get to his work. Uh, he is actually frozen, and the only thing he is dreaming about right now is getting home or to a pub and having a sip of uh, hard warming up beer. And all the advertisement in this whole work the same. And actually, in England, only three, three types of products were um, promoted. It's the foreign ones, uh, new ones, and... Uh, commodities that are relevant to certain events. And for example, we have here a poster of Dajin, analog of Russian vodka. And it depicts a painter-like Rembrandt of golden age of Holland. And he's having a sip of this drink from its canonic bottle. And we can see the effect on his face. And the second type of objects promoted when newly invented ones. And in 1818s, about 10 power plants appeared in London in that invented in some way electric heating. But electric heating was meant to replace fireplace, traditional center of English household. And many people untrusted it. And as Nicholas Persner puts it, one of Englishness features is uh, the love and admiration of the British culture to uh, aristocratic mansions, aristocratic mansion, pictorial parks, and beloved pets, dogs and horses. And here we can see uh, those beloved pets and they're enjoying the electric heating. That means uh, that electric heating is really good as trans and trust with it. And actually, here we can compare this poster to a famous famous piece by Thomas Gainsborough. It was on our exhibition and it those are the dogs which Gainsborough painted to pay for musical lessons for his music teacher. And now let's move to the third group of objects. They are objects that are connected with uh, certain events. And of course, the most important event in the Victorian age 
English everyday life is Christmas. The most pleasant part of Christmas is gaining presents. And the most hard one is coming up with an idea of a good present for your family. And this poster uh, of Codex is whispering for a potential consumer in December an idea for a good present. And all the advertisements we saw in this uh, call are um, very polite. They never promote an object just face to face directly. They are all indirect and implicit. And most of posters in this hall are dedicated to pantomimes. And this is something that uh, completely not understandable by Russian audience because it's a specific local uh, British phenomenon. They appeared mostly in 19th century and they were theatrical performances presented uh, on Christmas holidays for families. And here we can see, for example, a poster of geisha performance. Here we can see a Cinderella poster. And if we just name all these posters, we will see a passing bat, Cinderella, uh, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Mulan, and all the fables that became base of Pixar and Disney that are today uh, important and fundamental part of modern um, mass culture. And here we also see giant posters of Rubinson, Crusoe, Pentamim, and all those Pentamims were um, unique. And they used uh, movable stages, lightning, smoke effects, and Robinson Crusoe was played in a special manner by a woman and in some, in some place. Uh, Friday was also a woman, and uh, Robinson Crusoe that Friday because he she was the princess of an island, and we have different funny uh, and unique variations of classical fables. And so we have described historical context and have analyzed uh, poster posters of the late 19th century. And now let's move to the next call. It is dedicated to underground uh, posters. And at the beginning of 20th century, London, like major world cities, Vienna, Berlin, Paris, New York, was radically modernized and became a megapolis in modern type, in modern sense of the word. And that led to two major consequences. And first was invention of photographic printing and tremendous increase of paper production. Here we can see a poster by Agnes Richardson, and it promotes a uh, sea pity, um, and we would call it today kitsch. It's a mass souvenir post for production. And the second consequence of this urbanistic modernization is in development of transport system. And in case in London, we should, of course, speak of its famous metropolitan. But many people did not trust underground and as they did not trust, for example, electric heating at first. And for that, um, many artists turned to underground posters. And actually, in the beginning of 20th century, uh, poster production becomes not something antisocial or marginal, but a socially accepted uh, occupation. And many professional artists start producing advertisements. And for instance, here we can see a poster by Mabel Lucy. She was uh, an illustrator of children's book and she uh, promoted underground in the same indirect manner. It never says that Metropolitan is expensive, or cheap or quiet. It always promotes it indirectly. And for instance, here it promotes us by stress and where you can get by underground. And we can see uh, fairly creatures, uh, fairly characters, and they are going to pantomime. Uh, and here Mabel Lucy depicted her three children and in the next decade, the famous uh, baby dolls will be produced after this image. Moreover, we can see Smurfies, uh, here and they also promote underground indirectly. They stress that under earth there is no snow, fog, or rain, and the weather is always good. But the most interesting part of this whole are the wealth posters made by 
Anthony Sark. They were exhibited in light boxes. We can see them everywhere today, but originally they were invented in London to promote underground. And they uh, face a plenty of aspects that Pevsner would call Englishness. And first of all, they are humoristic. And humor in English strict social hierarchy is something that, as Pevsner put it, puts it, unifies the whole nation and provides an opportunity for a man or a woman without the aristocratic origins or valuable uh, property um, be um, mentioned by ours. And all those posters are made in satiric, uh, humoristic visual language. And also they connected with another Englishness value that Pevsner called love and admiration for cultural heritage and scientific technological achievements. And here we can see again, posters that stress where you can get by underground. And for instance, here in January, we can get to play um, by the ground. And here we can see a phrase, not a certain race, but a door opener. And it's humoristic phrase about QEs in London theaters of the beginning of the century. And for instance, I like, uh, this poster. It promotes South and Beach. And here we can see a quotation, the struggle for existence began on the seashore. It's quotation from Charles Darwin. And in this context, it sounds really funny. And uh, moreover, um, Sark uses quotations from different famous literature uh, pieces, for example, Shakespeare, like here, like he's, like here. Uh, in producing these posters. And his posters are some kind of intellectual quiz. They play this level of education of an average British citizen. And uh, that led to production of another posters. We can see them here. And the mechanism is the same, promoting a place where you can get by underground. But the language has changed radically. We can see here some impressionism features. And it's not a co coincidence. In 1910, famous uh, Roger Fry uh, exhibited French impress Impressionism in England for the first time. And so taking into account those unique, subtle, indirect mechanisms of the British advertisements, it's play with Englishness features and its intellectual character, the best way to develop uh, British poster server is to involve uh, avant-gardistic achievements of contemporary art. And that's something that really happened next. And now let's move to the next call. It is dedicated to the posters of London public transport system that appeared in 1910s, 1920s. And here we can see a famous logo of the underground and all those posters are connected with Sir Arthur Talents. He was the manager of London public system of transport. And he uh, gained a group of talented professional artists and he wanted to create new types of posters. Moreover, he changed the image of London uh, radically. In 19th century, London is something that is connected with rain, Jack the Ripper, rain, uh, Sherlock Holmes, coal, um, smoke, rain, um, dirty air, dirty water, dark Gothic architecture, and so on. And most people who visit London in the 19th century go on business trips, not tourist ones. And so of Atalans uh, actually provided a design with this famous crimson color. He produced, uh, he invented those red telephone booths and double decker buses. He also influenced change of uh, Royal Guards uniform and he shaped the modern uh, image of London as friendly uh, city with highly technologically developed and comfortable infrastructure. And all those posters here again uh, promote underground by stressing where you can get using underground. But the language is still changing and we can see here different uh, influences of French modernist painting. For example, here we can see posters of John Frederick Banting 
and he depicts Albert Topolis or Victorian Talbot Museum. And for him, uh, this museum is a giant total surrealistic piece of art. And he admires all the artifacts of natural history and ancient civilizations. And for example, here we can see a poster promoting Chiswick House, a famous neoclassical mansion near London. And it is done in pontillistic neo-impressionist mayor. It was made by Vera Ross, and we can see the artist and her son, Fidon, was once in the right lower corner. And my favorite posters of this hall are the four we can see now. They were made by uh, Clifford Ellis. And according to Pevner, one of the key features of Englishness is the admiration of the great British culture to its natural heritage. And those posters uh, demonstrate rural areas and countryside where you can get using uh, metropolitan and railway lines. And actually, it has quotations from famous poets like William Wordsworth and members of his Lake School. They traveled in 19th century through uh, nature of England and admired as it as something metaphysical and universally valued. And all those uh, posters are very subtle. We can not see the name of underground. We can see just logo somewhere in the corner. And here the uh, poem says the Basil Woodpecker is the only one who uh, destroys quietness in the forest. And it's a subtle promotion that underground is really quiet means of transport. Uh, noise was one of counter arguments against using the underground. So, for example, this poster by Sark uh, emphasizes that underground is uh, ecologically friendly and it does not destroy um, waters and nature of the UK. And here we may uh, compare posters from this hall with different works from. Pushkin museums here. And for example, here we can see a poster by Magnate Koffer and on the right, a painting by Eugene Carrier. And he promoted a symbolism style and he was famous for blurry air, blurry colors that translated some uh, transcendental uh, symbolic meaning. And Koffer uses this um, method to poetize nature. And for example, on the right side, we can see a painting by Kess van Dongen, who poeticized burlesque, bohemian, cabaret culture of Paris. And Williamson makes uh, a very similar poster promoting uh, London uh, summer festivals. And here we can see a cityscape by Claude Monet um, and the poster of Pierce and influence of impressionist city, vivid cityscapes uh, was especially valued in London. And now, and the last one is the influence of Pavism movement of Henri Matisse with its theoretical uh, in the role of colors and painting, uh, drawing, painting, uh, Albert and Victoria museums uh, has the same graceful and childish, uh, sophisticated view on everyday subjects. And this method, uh, organizing posters, this involving uh, avant-gardistic and cutting-edge achievements of art, actually was uh, later uh, picked up not by only uh, governmental structures, but by private companies. And actually, it became a universal value. All the best artistic uh, modern uh, advertisements require a good knowledge of visual tradition, art history, and uh, high education. And for example, we can see this in the next hall. It is uh, the one dedicated to Shell Concern posters. And in my opinion, it's the climax of this exhibition. It's my favorite hall. And it is hard to speak about it as it hard to speak about a hall where Picasso, Cezanne, Monet, 
Malevich and Kandinsky are exhibited in one space at one time because all those posters were made by the best English and foreign artists of the time. It's the uh, avant-gardistic achievement of contemporary history of art. And all those posters are made in completely different uh, cutting edge styles. Um, <clears throat> and for example, we can compare them with other works from Pushkin Museum. For instance, we can see a poster by Paul Nash uh, and a painting by André Deren. And the style is really contemporary, similar, and avant-gardistic. We can see a green shop poster and Pablo Picasso's portrait of Ambroise Vollard. And moreover, those uh, posters are close to uh, avant-gardistic achievements of Russian communist design and, for example, Neuzoklichkeit of Bauhaus. Here we can see Alexander Rochenko photographic uh, poster promoting book sales and uh, on the left uh, shell poster. And on the right we can see a futuristic uh, suprematistic painting by Kazimir Malevich and on the left poster by Green Shot. They're really similar. And the last one is Claude Monet Giverny Garden and uh, Morris's Gardeners prefer shell. And all those posters were placed on shell petrol trucks because at the time it was uh, prohibited to put any kind of advertisements on billboards outside the city. They may distract the driver. Uh, and it's something uh, revolutionary. Uh, and in 1932, there was an exhibition of those posters and Kenneth Clark so, and the director of National Gallery compared originals with photographic reproductions, and he said that painting is dying because all those reproductions are more effective than their pictorial uh, prototypes, really. And since then, British Museum and National Gallery started collecting posters. And here we can recall those of Thoughtsley, who said that beauty will break through posters to the city uh, and that will involve uh, achievements of modern history of art. And that's something that really happened. And this was uh, picked up by the rest of the world in 1930s and 1940s. And they are moving now to the last hall. It is dedicated to uh, posters of Art Deco Epoch or 1930s, 19. And here we can see a poster uh, that's promoting Royal Mail line, and we can see an aristoc aristocrat of 19th golden uh, Victorian age century. And according to Pevsner, one of the brightest Englishness feature, features of the British culture is a specific sense of session. And he stressed that dandism, phenomenon of dandism is based on wearing expensive, uh, beautiful, fabulous dresses and leaving a consciousness, carelessness element, which actually is the best sign of natural grace and elegance. And he also emphasized that in condition of strict social hierarchy, English aristocrats uh, formed a very elegant, relaxed, uh, and charismatic way of body language. And for example, we can see aristocracy on Gainsborough portraits in very luxurious postures. And here we can see such an aristocrat. And on the right side, we can see a man of 20th century. And he's wearing completely different dress, but he is uh, one of the uh, bearers of this dandism tradition. And actually in 1920s, 1930s, mass fashion appeared. Uh, all those aristocratic dresses were tailored by order, but in 1920s, a ready-made clothes appeared. And here we can see beautiful posters of certain Purvis. He was royal industrial designer, and he promoted different clothing shops. And actually, uh, Art Deco style is based on avant-gardistic uh, methods, but it returns to figurative realistic image. And the fashion is in the core of Art Deco. And here we can see 
Austin Reyes shop poster um, or NL then. And is as Yves Saint Laurent said, the best and most fashionable things pieces are invented in London, London made in Rome and sold in Paris. And at the time, Max and Spencer, Benetton and shops, companies, uh, markets like that appear uh, and they are the best in Westphalia today. And if we uh, look into high fashion, the most important events in this sphere of last decades were Vivian Westwood and Alexander McQueen. And English fashion became universally valued. And in conclusion, I would like to show the last poster. It's uh, really nice. It was made in 1930 um, oh, in Art Deco style, because Art Deco is very suitable uh, quite suitable for poster production. And it is dedicated to 100th anniversary of Melbourne. And we can see here John Batman's and his race. We, this will be the place for a village. And in the backspace, we can see a beautiful, fabulous city that looks like New York from Roaring Twenties. And this is New York of Art Deco, actually. And so this is all the exhibition. And to sum up, we have seen how the best example of highly professional artistic uh, posters and advertisements was built up in England in the beginning of 20th century, and how that phenomenon made uh, certain unique features of the British culture, like humor, politeness, sense of fashion, love for nature, scientific achievements, uh, cultural heritage, universally valued and globally accepted. Um, <clears throat> And that's all that I wanted to say. Thank you very much for, for listening to me. And uh, I believe, I hope that pandemic will end soon and we will be able to see um, posters and French paintings in Pushkin Museum, travel by London Metropolitan, see all those places promoted by shell posters and see such a world pearl as Melbourne. Thank you very much, and I will be glad to answer your questions if you have them. Ilya, um, many thanks for that absolutely fascinating tour. Uh, the passion uh, for the subject, you, you really brought that out. And uh, as a Londoner, I have to say, um, I know you stressed it rains a lot, but I've, I've never actually felt that much. But uh, yes, I, I know perception is, is always important, uh, and you're absolutely <laughs> right. Most, uh, most people who haven't been to London will always uh, think it rains the whole time. But it was a, a brilliant tour. Um, I, I certainly found it absolutely fascinating. And actually, we will be visiting you again on the 22nd of December, although the tour will be in Russian on that day. Um, details are on the website if anyone's interested. But please join us. And uh, I, I would love to see it again myself. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's Winter Forum. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the day as much as I have. Um, I'll close by once again thanking the event sponsor, Hudson Sandler, and its managing partner and today's moderator, Andrew Hayes. I'd like to thank all the panelists again, Michael, Rebecca, Irina, Maxim, and David, and Dmitry Aksakov, who was interviewed at the beginning. Of course, a big thank you to the Pushkin Museum, and of course, most of all, to you, the RBCC members and friends for participating today. I'll sign off by wishing everyone a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And here's to 2021, which I know everyone is looking forward to. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>